Hi, Psych 213 students. Uh, we're now moving on to lecture seven. And in this lecture, we're going to talk about the evidence that we have that there's a difference between working memory and long term memory. Now, this lecture is going to involve a lot of demonstrations that I normally do in class. We'll do our best to do them through this video. There's also a couple of videos that I'm going to have you watch. Now, I can't incorporate those videos into this video because of like copyright violations and things like that. But I will have the links in Canvas. And I'm going to encourage you to sort of pause this recording, watch that video. I'll set up the video in this video. Watch that video, then come back and watch a little bit of this video. That is the best way to do this because it will the, each video reveals a little bit different information that normally we talk about in class, but we just can't really do that here. So what we're going to do um, in this is we're going to first talk about how we actually test short-term memory and a little bit of the history for this. So uh, when we sort of think about short-term memory, we're talking about a, a memory system that holds information for a brief period of, of time. And prototypically, the way this was tested was by using something called a digit span. So I'm going to do a little demonstration to sort of show you what a digit span is. We're going to do, actually do a couple demonstrations for this. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a list of digits. And when there's a pause, I want you to recall the digits in order. And we'll see how many you can get right. And I'll talk a little bit about what happens uh, prototypically. I'll also, because of the way this demo works, is I'll read out uh, what digits you should have uh, recalled. So it might work well if you have somebody there who can sort of listen to your recall or participate with you. Could be a, a little bit of fun if you do it with somebody uh, in your house or apartment. So here we go. I'm going to play the video and you'll see that there's a little cue to recall them. Recall the digits in order that you see them. Okay, so pause the video here, recall them in order. The digits, though, that you should have had, 791862. So let's do another sequence. Here we go again. Same, same thing, another list. Okay, you can pause it here, recall the digits. Should be 02905483. Let's do another list. Okay, pause it here, recall. Okay, it should be 18693715.03. Now you probably found that last list really difficult to do. And it was really difficult to do because uh, it exceeded your ability to, exceeded your ability, your capacity for short-term memory. So these this digit span was first pioneered by Joseph Jacobs he was interested in quantifying the mental capacity of his students, and so he created this digit span task. And uh, Miller, 1956, found that our digit span is 7 plus or minus 2, and you might have heard this referred to as the magic number, 7 plus or minus 2. And what Miller was actually talking about is we have 7 plus or minus 2 chunks or pieces of information that can be in our short-term memory, our working memory. So that's why uh, I created that long list of, let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten. So the last sequence was ten digits. So that should have mostly um, exceeded the capacity for most of your working memories, and you would have struggled to recall that last series of digits, but probably did the other two strings of digits relatively okay. And that's why, because we have uh, limited capacity, seven plus or minus two pieces of information. So I usually do another digit span demo here, and I'll just play it for you, uh, our second demo here. And I usually hand out a couple of hints. 
So we can store a little bit. We can store a little bit more information in our memory if we uh, use a mnemonic. And uh, so look for Joshua four. He talks a little bit about this using mnemonics, and it works for working memory as well. So I usually play this demo and then a handout uh, hints to half of the class, and half of the class gets a, a hint to group the digits into chunks of three. And this is actually sort of shown by Wickelgren that it's best to remember a series of digits in chunks of three. Uh, so that's what I, that's one hint that I give to half of the other people. And you'll see that this is a really, really long list of, of digits. Another hint that I give is um, that these uh, sequences of digits relate them to uh, historical events. So I'm going to play this. See if you can do that. See if you can use the historical one. That's a little bit better mnemonic in this particular case. And I'll be willing to bet that you can remember lots of these digits, way more than the 7 plus or minus 2 by using this mnemonic. So let me play, play, try to recall them, see how well you do. All right, so try to recall those digits. You can pause here. Probably difficult, right? There were 16 different digits. If you were able to recall them by using the historical dates, the first one was December 7th, 1941. So that would be, uh, and that's Pearl Harbor. So that would be 12071941. The second historical date was 9-11-2001. So 09 -1 -1 -2 -0 -0 -1 two important dates in American history, right? And so if you use that mnemonic, you can now group together into two chunks of information, not that hard to remember, right? But remembering 16 digits would be nearly impossible for, for anyone. And usually when I do this in the class, usually one person who got the history cue can remember much more than the people who even got the chunking cue. But chunking does work. So if you group the digits into three groups of three, that does work. Uh, but it's better if you even have uh, a better mnemonic like uh, using historical events. So we know that it's really the capacity of short-term or working memory is chunks of information, not actual digits. Although sometimes, depending on how you test it, it is just digits. So I usually also run another demonstration here at this particular point in time. And I give you this third one to sort of compare it to. So in this one, I'm going to show you a list of pictures, and then we'll test your memory for these pictures. Now, we have to test the memory a little bit different. I'm going to show you a, a real picture that you saw and one that you didn't see, and you have to pick the one uh, that was um, actually shown. I think you'll find this a lot easier than sort of the digit spans. And this is to show you sort of how um, our working memory can actually hold a different amounts of information depending on what kind of information it is. So here we go. Oh, wait. Let me make sure I'm on list one here. Oh, no, I don't know why it says list two. Okay, here we go. Okay, so that was the, uh, so the question is, which of these pictures uh, did you see in that sequence? Okay, hopefully you picked the right one there, pick B. So here's another one. Hopefully you picked, usually this one's pretty easy, you picked A. Uh, hopefully you picked A here as well. Hopefully you picked B. B is the one that you saw. A is the picture there. B is the picture that you saw. A. A. B. 
A, B, and A. Okay, and so the point of this uh, memory span demos to sort of show you this had the same number of items. So there were 16 pictures, right? Just like our um, last digit span demo that we did. Uh, they were presented at half the exposure time. So one second for the digits, 500 milliseconds or half a second for the pictures. And this was a lot easier for you to remember which pictures you saw. There's much more information in pictures. And in fact, some memory mnemonics help you convert information into an image to make it easier to remember, right? This is part of what Joshua 4 is going to show you when you're reading the book, how to capitalize on that concept of turning information into a visual image, and it's easier to store that information. There's just much more information there, and it's easier for you to remember if there's more information. So that's how we test short-term memory gives you a little bit of a flavor for that. So what's the evidence though that we have this difference between short-term or what we're going to call working memory and we have this other long-term store. Uh, so there's four pieces of evidence that we're going to talk about. The first is the what's called sort of the Brown-Peterson paradigm and so I'm going to give you a demonstration of this. Again we have another demo. Usually I ask for uh, a volunteer here. Um, and so what I'm going to do in this is uh, ask you to read a list of words, and when you're prom prompted, you can recall them in any order. So now you can re recall this list of words in any order. So this first list, just to get you going, should find this pretty easy. Okay, so you should recall those. You should recall purple dragon bathroom clock random. Okay, now I want you to do the same thing in the second list, but you're going to be prompted with a number. And when you get that number, I want you to count backwards by threes uh, until I tell you to stop on this video, right? So let me give you an example. So suppose I show you the example 200, you would start to count backwards and do it out loud. Uh, 197, 194, 191, 188. Keep going. Keep subtracting three from each number until I tell you to stop. And then you're going to get a cue to recall the words. And we'll see how you do. This will be better if you have somebody helping you out here. Sort of make sure you're doing it right. But here we go. So study these words. All right, so you should start counting backwards by three. Keep going, no cheating. Keep going, few more. Okay, now recall the words. And what you should find is it's really hard to recall these words, but it's after park, yellow, raven, phone. Most of the time people get two or three of these. Now keep in mind, that's only uh, five words to recall. That's well within your capacity of working memory, uh, but yet you that task of counting backwards sort of wipes out your ability to remember things in working memory. So this is what we say you have in working memory you have rapid forgetting. So what was once there is gone pretty quickly when you convert over and start subtracting numbers. The subtracting numbers occupies your working memory and so the information, while it's in your working memory, gets pushed out very rapidly, right? And in long-term memory, there's a much slower rate of forgetting. We actually have a whole lecture that will talk about forgetting in long-term memory. But you do forget things out of long-term memory, but it's a much slower rate of learning, not on the order of seconds or so. Um, now, this rapid forgetting concept, I also usually talk about, uh, imagine that you're at a cocktail party or any party for that matter and you get introduced to somebody and you greet them and you shake their hand and you 
maybe even say their name back to them. You say, hi, how's it going? Nice to meet you. My name is Andy. And you say, hey, Andy, nice to meet you. And then you engage in a conversation with somebody else. And you, a few minutes later, you look back at that person and you realize that you have forgotten their name. Now, you encoded it, right? Because you heard their name and you maybe said it back to them, right? But you didn't do anything to promote moving of that information from working memory to long-term memory, right? So you didn't sort of think to yourself, hey, I have a brother named Andy or I have a cousin named Andy. If you did, that would be a deep form of encoding and most likely would help you remember that person's name. If you don't do those sorts of things, while it is in your working memory, it may not stay there very long and you might forget it quite rapidly, right? So that forgetting rate much faster uh, tells us or is some evidence that we have this working memory system that holds memory that we're working with or in our immediate consciousness. And then we have this other long-term memory system that holds information for much longer periods of time. So that's one piece of evidence, this forgetting rate. Another piece of evidence is something called the recency effect. Usually I run a demonstration here to sort of demonstrate the recency effect. So here's our uh, last demonstration that we'll do for this particular set of material. And so in this um, recency effect uh, demonstration, uh, I'm going to just have you read a list of words, recall them in any order, like our previous one. So here we go. Okay, so recall them. You can pause the video here as you're recalling the words. So what you should have recalled, if you got them all, was more, great, wheel, tall, match, after, fight, report, doctor, race, cotton. Most of the time what happens, if you're recalling them, you're going to recall the ones that were most recently presented to you, hence the name recency effect. So a lot of times people will sort of say, like, doctor, race, cotton, then try to remember items that were in the middle of the list or earlier at the start of the list, right? This is something called the recency effect. Uh, so you're better for remembering probably, and if we did this over and over and over again, you would see that probabilistically you're going to remember the items at the end of the sequence better than you are at the middle or at the beginning of the, beginning of the sequence, right? Um, now, the co most common explanation for the recency effect is what you're doing is you're using your working memory. So you're reading those quickly out of working memory before they disappear from your working memory. And then your other items, you're either using long-term memory or some other strategy. We can get rid of this effect. We can get rid of the recency effect if you have a delay, right? So if you introduce a delay where they're no longer reading out of working memory, because remember, you only hold things in your working memory for as long as you're thinking about it or you give some sort of intervening task. So have people focus on something else for a while and the recency effect goes away. And so what this tells us is that you're simultaneously using working memory and long-term memory to produce this particular effect where more recent items are better recalled out of a sequence for that, right? Now, I wanna pause here and just give you a, a two words, uh, important caveats here when we're talking about that. When we're talking about testing immediate memory, we're making people do two tasks at the same time, right? So like for the Brown-Peterson task, you recalled a list of words, but you also subtracted digits. That's two tasks at the same time. So this isn't the same as a dichotic listening task, right, where you could shadow a little bit of one ear, shadow a little bit of a, the message in the other ear, and still remember uh, two messages. Or it's not like the nicer study where the secretaries were reading and taking dictation because they could switch between those two tasks to accomplish those goals, right? What we're doing is we're forcing people to do the task at the same time. Uh, the other important caveat to remember here is that although we're talking about a distinction between working memory and long-term memory, they work together. They, they uh, share information. So information goes through working memory into long-term memory. So don't lose sight of the fact that these are two separable things but they're working together. So back to our evidence for working versus long-term memory. So in the beginning, when we talked about um, testing short-term memory, we talked about limited capacity, right? You could only hold seven plus or minus two pieces of information, a little bit more if it was pictures, but 
there's limited capacity of working memory. Uh, whereas long-term memory has theoretically unlimited capacity. You can put as much information in your long-term memory as you want to store, right? So that difference in capacity, how much it can hold, is also evidence of long-term memory. Now, the last piece of evidence is a neuropsych evidence that comes from, to us from a patient. And he was known to us uh, in the U.S. We protect patient identity. And he was known as HM. He subsequently died. And uh, his name was released after he died. His name was Henry Molazon. And um, he provided some really important evidence that there's a strong, clear evidence that there's a difference between working memory and long-term memory. So this is the point where I usually have you watch a video. So what I'm going to ask you to do here is pause this recording and watch the amnesic video uh, that describes his case. And we'll come back and we'll summarize. Then you can resume with this video and we'll summarize uh, what happened with his case and get some details or the important details out of that video. So go ahead and watch that video and I'm going to move forward here. So to talk about patient HM, to summarize, so he had severe epilepsy, and uh, Scoville performed an operation on him to remove the portion of his brain that was a cause of these seizures. So that's the hippocampus. So you can sort of see what was removed in HM here. These are the MRIs from his brain while he was still alive uh, that showed you his hippocampus was largely removed. And so what HM suffered from, he had a little bit of retrograde amnesia. He lost a little bit of information so this was when the operation happened, right? So he lost a little bit of information right before uh, the operation happened. But for the most part, his distant memory was relatively intact. He could tell those stories about his childhood, et cetera. Uh, this is fairly normal following any kind of uh, brain damage that you might lose a little bit of information right before the brain damage occurs, retrograde amnesia. What was really interesting about HM is he had profound anterior grade amnesia. That is, he couldn't form any new long-term memories. He couldn't make any new long-term memories. So a way to think about patient HM is that the link between working memory and long-term memory was broken, right? So he could pull things out of his long-term memory, like remote past events. He could pull them out and he could describe them to people, but he couldn't form new long-term memories. So this link right here, this consolidation link, uh, was broken. Now keep in mind, his working memory was perfectly fine, right? So he could do those tasks if you ask him to remember something, as long as he kept it active in his working memory, right? So there's a part of the video where Brenda Milner asks him to remember a number and he keeps thinking about it and he's able to remember that number. Well, that's information in his working memory and he performed well on those digit span tasks and all the tests of working memory he performed equally well. But if you started testing his long-term memory, that's where you would show uh, where he had some profound deficits. So the other interesting thing about HM, and the video sort of talked a little bit about this, and uh, I'll show you some other videos which sort of amplify this, is that he could learn some skills. So he had damage to his long-term memory, and pretty much what you would consider your memory, he couldn't remember anything, but he did have some skill learning that was preserved. So like the mirror tracing test, for example. So he was given this mirror tracing, he would trace the star, and you can see sort of his performance gets much better. So these are errors on the trial. So he would struggle at first because looking at your hand in a mirror is kind of awkward, but eventually you get much better at it. And you can see by the third day, he would uh, perform it really well, even though he couldn't remember ever having done this particular task. Another example is the Tower of Annoy puzzle. So that we give that this puzzle is used a lot in the problem solving literature. And the idea here is you have a stack of rings and your goal is to move the stack of rings from one peg to the other peg. And there's a couple rules. You can only move one uh, ring at a time. So you can't just pick up this whole stack and put the whole stack down there. And you can only put uh, smaller rings on top of larger rings. So the bottom line is, depending on how many pegs and how many rings you have, there's an optimal number of moves to solve the puzzle accurately so you can look at the number of moves to sort of as a measure or indicator of learning. And you know HM would do this puzzle at first and do it just like you would but eventually get better at it and solve it faster uh, even though he had no clear memory of this of doing this puzzle. So he's showing that there was some information that was preserved. 
So Brenda Milner is going to, in this video, I want you to watch, uh, she'll talk a little bit more about patient HM, her experience with them, and uh, some of these distinctions uh, that we're making here between the kinds of tasks he was able to do. And it sort of shows you how you can learn from an individual uh, patient case summary uh, uh, information about, that's relevant to learning and memory. Now, uh, let me set up this Clive video. Uh, so Clive Wearing, uh, so he was in the UK and they apparently don't protect his identity. So there's all these kinds of videos you can find of Clive on uh, YouTube. This is just a short excerpt to give you a sense of what it's like. Now, he had, uh, or he is very similar to patient HM. He had damage to both of his hippocampus. It was um, caused by a case of herpes that got into his brain. Most patients don't survive. Clive did survive that, but he was left with really profound amnesia. Now, when you watch the video, it's going to say he's the most severe case. That's not true because HM uh, also had a very similar uh, pattern. You'll notice also in the video that Clive is playing the piano. He was a, a musician and he could still play the piano and even learn new uh, piano pieces if he spent some time sort of playing it. So but this gives you a, this video that you'll see gives a video or gives you a sense of how fleeting his memory is. So when she's interviewing him, that's real time. They didn't cut away or anything like that and just watch at how profoundly uh, amnesic he is. So let's wrap all this stuff up, patient HM and Clive. Uh, what's the important things to take away? So this was the first case to implica implicate the hippocampus and memory, so connecting this structure to memory, and we now know that the hippocampus does a lot for memory. It's a very crucial role. Mem doesn't store memories in the hippocampus, but it's certainly very, very important in forming memories for sure. And the second point here is it demonstrated that the medial temporal lobes, of which the hippocampus is a part of the medial, medial temporal lobes, are involved in memory consolidation, are forming memories. The hippocampus is actually necessary for that uh, to happen. His case, HM's case, provided evidence for a distinction between working memory. So remember, his working memory was intact and his long-term memory was damaged. So that's really why we're talking about this in this particular point. Uh, there was some debate about whether we had a working memory or long-term memory, and HM's case put uh, that debate to rest. It's very clear evidence because he had one of them were intact, the other one was damaged. If they were the same thing or somewhat related, you couldn't have this kind of dissociation. Uh, and by the way, there are patients that have some long-term memory damage, but uh, I'm sorry, have uh, working memory damage, but long-term memory is intact. So the, the opposite of that. The last thing is uh, HM provided evidence for a distinction between two kinds of long-term memory. That is what we're going to call implicit long-term memory. This was intact. So this was his skill learning. So think of the mirror tracing task or the Tower of Hanoi or any of the other skills that he could learn, this was intact. But his explicit long-term memory, so all of the things that we typically think about memory, this was profoundly damaged. We're going to come back to this point when we talk about uh, long-term memory and retrieval much more in depth, but this was the first evidence that maybe we have these two different kinds of memory system systems.